strongly would support the view that it's divinely inspired or revealed. So the question has to be thrown back into the lap of those who are making the claim, which is uh, highly implausible given everything else we know about how books come into being, or literatures come into being, or law codes come into being, or legends, or, or stories about uh, uh, cosmology or cosmogony. So um, if it's something that can't be proven or disproven, it's not a very strong argument in the first place for something. If it's not disconfirmable, uh, then I can say anything is divinely inspired and or divinely revealed, and fine, you can make that claim and go ahead and do it. But I don't think the burden of proof is on those who challenge that. Yeah, but you didn't challenge it in, in the beginning. You said that scholarship established that the Torah is a human work, and and that seems an absurd position. Uh, uh, one could establish any work of literature is you know entirely human or whatever. Well, what I mean, I, I guess, what I mean to say is that when one looks at the biblical uh, scholarship and the comparative religious study, one sees, for example, that many of the stories or many of the laws that one finds in the Bible. Uh, are very similar to or are responses to law codes or uh, narratives of, let's say, ancient floods or the code of Hammurabi. Uh, many of the images or descriptions about the God of Israel uh, clearly are derived in their imagery and many of their fundamental concepts from, uh, let's say, Canaanite notions of the deity Baal. So that it just seems much more plausible to see how the biblical stories and laws are derivatives of, adaptations of, reactions to uh, the general ancient Near Eastern culture and context in which the ancient Israelites were living. So uh, that's the sense in which I mean it is, I, I, don't, I shouldn't use the word proven, I think. I, I think that I use the phrase, it's much more plausible in terms of degrees of plausibility for explaining how a certain work came into being uh, the much more plausible explanation is that it's uh, these are human works. I would definitely not say it's proven in any kind of absolute uh, sense of the term. And in the book, I do discuss uh, degrees of plausibility, and that one of the actual um, difficulties one has in the kinds of discussions about what's more reasonable, my view or your view, how do you assess degrees of reasonableness or plausibility? So I do approach that subject. I don't have any definitive, uh, absolute uh, measuring scale for it, uh, but I do think that it's pretty reasonable to talk about degrees of plausibility in assessing uh, authorship of a document. Also, there are many internal contradictions. There are many things that are that are clearly, if taken more or less literally, false statements or false understandings about reality uh, in the Bible. So to talk about that being as a uh, device, divinely revealed would go against any uh, concept of God as uh, omniscient, uh, well-knowing. So that's another way in which claims to the divinity of the Bible are rendered implausible. Okay, great. Got it. Let me think about what, you, what you've been saying. Uh, you mentioned several reasons for writing the book, and the last one was the personal one. Was the personal one the first one, and the and the others followed upon that? Um, it's very hard to say. I don't. Uh, I don't know that that's the case because the book evolved over many years. I've been thinking about these questions since I was twenty-three, or since I was I probably fifteen, maybe. Uh, but I would say, no, I think that the first. Thing probably was this intellectual curiosity. I was asking myself the question, why is it that I know so many people who had an education similar to mine, including members of my own family, who uh, continued to affirm their belief in traditional uh, Orthodox Jewish doctrines and dogmas? And these people, I say, are as educated as I am. Many of them I consider to be quite smarter than I am in terms of you know, IQ, greater knowledge of many areas, whether it's philosophy or other subject matters, and yet what to me seems so patently unreasonable to them seems to seem reasonable. So I was very curious as to why did I kind of come to the conclusions that I reached, and they came to conclusions that they reached, given both their high-level intelligence and the similarities in our uh, backgrounds and education. 
So that, 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 that really, Chile, because my background really, in addition to Jewish studies, my doctorate's in psychology. So I tend to, you know, always ask psychological questions when I think about religious experience, religious beliefs, uh, religious behavior, etc. So I think that was the, the first uh, uh, motivator. Uh, the, the, the personal experience thing also was important, uh, and I talk about that actually in the first chapter of the book, which is about my autobiographical reflections. But um, it's hard to say, you know, uh, which had priority, and um, all of them, over time, merged into multiple motivations for writing the book. Uh, I think that most of our behavior isn't determined by just one single factor or cause, and same thing in my case. Got it, got it. Do you believe in God? I would say that I, um, uh, I don't believe in any personal God. Uh, now, I don't know whether or not there is a transcendent force that created the universe. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. I don't know of any compelling evidence that there is. Um, uh, but even if I were to be, let's say, uh, put myself in the category of a deist, not that I am, but let's say I were a deist, like the founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, um, the notion that there is a God who created the universe, but doesn't then get involved in any way in it, to me, it doesn't make all that much of a difference in terms of how one leads one's life. It's, it's, not, it's not a question that really has any significant practical impact. So I would probably call myself an agnostic. Somebody referred to me in a different term. I thought it was quite interesting. A functional atheist. <laughs> in the sense, you know, whether or not I believe there is a God, it's not really all that relevant to the way I lead my life or the way I think about reality. Um, I, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Uh, okay, go ahead, Luke. Yeah. Uh, I, I've heard it argued that one cannot live as an agnostic. One either lives as an atheist or one lives as a believer. What do you think of that argument? Uh, first of all, I don't know. We, one, one can't. I don't know why one can't live that way. And uh, also, you'd have to define the terms because these terms, agnostic, atheist, can have you know several different meanings. That people understand them in different ways. What do you mean by that? And then maybe I can respond more. You know, okay, great. I mean, on question, a, on what do you mean by that? Yeah, on a, on a practical matter, you, if you live believing that God matters, if you or that uh, you you either live believing that God matters or you live absent of that. You 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 can't really live as an agnostic. You have to choose in your actions. Like, you, give me an example of where. W- the, an action would be quite different uh, if you believe that God exists or that God doesn't exist. Now, not, now we're not talking here about whether God revealed his will to people. You're right, right, whether, right, right. Whether God right. exists or not. How would that change? Let me ask you, what would you do differently than you now do if you believe in, I don't know what you believe or not, but if you believe in God who exists but no way interacts with the world which he might which he created, uh, or he doesn't exist at all. Would that change in any significant way the way in which you behave? No. So, but but most yeah. people, when you say, I mean, most people, when you say do you believe in God or not, are, are dealing with the personal God who, uh, the belief in a personal God who who is interested in his creation and kind of rewards and punishes. That's kind of the whole the whole package for, for most people on a practical basis. Uh, well, yes, I don't believe in that kind of a God. Uh, so you can call it whatever you want to call him if you want to call that an atheist. So that, that You can use the term if you want to. But yeah, that's the, I don't believe in a God who interacts with humans and is following their activity and rewarding and punishing them accordingly. Did you see that Woody Allen movie, Crimes and Misdemeanors? I, yeah, I, I saw it. I saw it actually uh, yeah, a couple of times. I don't remember all the details of it, so you have to remind me if you're going to ask me a question about it. But uh, I, it just it just brings to mind. Uh, it was it was a movie where the, the the father of the protagonist keeps saying God has eyes, and uh, uh, and and one of the main characters gets away with murder while the while the rabbi who believes in God goes blind. Mm-hmm. Uh, but just the notion that God has eyes 
was uh, 